Welcome back to Epistemology and the Search for Truth. Today's lesson is on the folly of fallacies. This is where it really gets fun. So last week we talked about the need for critical thinking and about the importance of learning argumentation and logic. Now in order to present a logical, well-reasoned argument, you must avoid fallacies that would render your argument false or at least unjustified. A fallacy is a kind of error in reasoning. We'll talk about some of the most common fallacies, and I'll provide brief explanations and examples of each of them at the end of the lesson. And until next week, we'll do even more fallacies because there's a lot of them. And we see them all the time on uh, the news and Facebook posts and opinion pieces and just people commenting and arguing back and forth. So fallacious arguments should not be persuasive, but they too often are. Fallacies may be created unintentionally, or they may be created intentionally in order to deceive other people. The vast majority of the commonly identified fallacies involve arguments, although some involve other explanations or definitions or other products of reasoning. Sometimes the term fallacy is used even more broadly to indicate any false belief or a cause of a false belief. The fallacies I'll share are considered logical or rhetorical fallacies and involve kinds of errors made while arguing informally in natural language. So an informal fallacy is fallacious because of both its form and its content. The formal fa fallacies are fallacious only because of their logical form. For example, the slippery slope fallacy has the following form. Step 1 often leads to step 2. Step 2 often leads to step 3. Step 3 often leads to until we reach an obvious, unacceptable step. Therefore, step 1 must not be acceptable. That form occurs in both good arguments and fallacious arguments. The quality of an argument of this form depends crucially on the probabilities of going from one step to another. The probabilities involve the argument's content, not merely its form. So let's talk about some fallacies. Now remember, fallacies are errors in reasoning that undermine the logic of an argument. They may be illegitimate arguments or irrelevant points that lack any support of evidence of a claim. We can have more fruitful debate and discussion if we all learn to avoid these common fallacies. So we're going to talk about some specific fallacies you've probably heard or maybe even used yourself without realizing it or intending to mislead or to give a fallacious argument, but we often use them. So let's start with ad hoc rescue. It's one of those Latin names because in the medieval ages, people were really interested in these logical fallacies. Ad hoc uh, means uh, to this and is thus commonly understood as meaning for this purpose. It can also be used to mean as needed, like an ad hoc committee. So this is ad hoc rescue. Psychologically, it is understandable that you would try to rescue a cherished belief from trouble. When faced with conflicting data, you are likely to mention how the conflict will disappear if some new assumption is taken into account. However, there is no good reason to accept this saving assumption other than it works to save your cherished belief. Your rescue is an ad hoc rescue. Let me give you an example. Yolanda says, if you take four of these tablets of vitamin C every day, you will never get a cold. Then someone else says, we'll call them George, I tried that last year for several months and still got a cold. So Yolanda says, did you take the tablets every day? This so other person says, yes. Then Yolanda says, well, I bet you got some bad tablets. You see, the burden of proof is definitely on Yolanda's shoulders to prove that the other person's vitamin C tablets were probably bad. That is, not really vitamin C. If Yolanda can't do so, her attempt to rescue her hypothesis that vitamin C prevents colds is simply a dogmatic refusal to face up to the possibility that she may indeed be wrong. It reminds me of this time at my first church I served. We were having a Lenten community service, and it started at 6 o'clock. But Janet and Wilbur came at 5 o'clock and they were livid that they were early. They said, I must have told them the wrong time. 
I said, eh? I said six o'clock, and everybody else knew six o'clock. It was in the bulletin, six o'clock, and it's outside on the sign right by the door, six o'clock. And they said, well, we must have gotten a wrong bulletin. Of everybody, they got the wrong bulletin. So the burden of proof is on them to show they have a wrong bulletin. They are ad hoc rescuing their belief that somehow they were told a different time. That their belief that it really should be at 5 o'clock, they're trying anything to find a way to rescue and prove that they were right. They must have gotten a wrong bulletin. I must have changed the sign at the last minute. That's an ad hoc rescue. And it's just a desperate attempt to save face, but we do it all the time. So the next fallacy we'll talk about is called the no true Scotsman fallacy. It's a type of ad hoc rescue of one's generalization in which the reasoner recharacterizes the situation solely in order to escape refutation of their generalization. For example, Mr. Smith says, all Scotsmen are loyal and brave. Mr. Jones says, but McDougal over there is a Scotsman, and he was arrested by his commanding officer from running away from the enemy. So Mr. Smith says, well, if that's right, it just shows that McDougal wasn't a true Scotsman. Christians use this a lot when someone makes a point about hypocrisy or how Christians sometimes do bad things. Someone may say, well, so-and-so says they're a Christian and they did this, that, and the other thing. It may be pointing out about Christians who end up getting charged with soliciting a prostitute or found with underage pornography or physically assaulting someone. These are actually very common things, often even among Christian leaders. One of the recent ones is big Christian evangelist named Ravi Zacharias was found to do all kinds of horrible things in his life. Now a person may say, how can a Christian do something like this and that? Instead of really wrestling with that question and thinking, out, well, do Christians sometimes do bad things? Can you still be a Christian and do something bad? In an attempt to save the good Christian name, we say, well, if that's the case, so-and-so wasn't a real or true Christian. We try to say they aren't Christian instead of wrestling with the fact that sometimes Christians and even Christian leaders, well-known Christian leaders, can be found to do really bad things. In fact, recently a lot of these megachurch pastors have been fired or laid off because of different kinds of misconduct. And I've seen it said, well, they weren't a real Christian. So if anyone ever uses phrases like true American, real American, true Christian, true patriot, real Democrat, real Republican, in an effort to deflect criticism, then they are probably falling into this particular fallacy. Even if they use their phrase at all, ever you hear that phrase, it should be a red flag for you that someone is trying to kind of distort the issue or get away from actually dealing with facts or challenges to just say, well, they're not a real one. So the real ones obviously believe this. That's always a fallacy, and, to, and it's a way to mislead and misdirect people. It's the true Scotsman fallacy. If you hear someone say, real people, real Christians, real Democrats, real Americans, red flag every time. Next up is a really common fallacy. I see this all the time. The slippery slope fallacy. So people use this argument to suggest that if A happens, then inevitably it would lead us on a path to Z. The fallacy is equating A with Z. It's a fear tactic because usually Z is something universally seen as negative. So if we don't want Z to occur, a must not be allowed to occur either, because inevitably, Z will happen. Example, if the church requires people to wear masks, next they require us to wear full hazmat suits to come to church. So the church shouldn't require masks. Now, pretty much all places required masks at some point this year, but there weren't too many uses of hazmat suits. That's a real one I actually saw in comments on Facebook. Hey, if masks are first, what next? Full hazmat suits? If they can make us wear a mask, what's next? They're going to put us in prison? 
it's the slippery slope. If one thing happens, obviously some horrible thing's going to happen next. You can make this argument with anything. Anything we do, you can make an argument could lead to something horrible down the road. I also see this one all the time. If the church sings any modern songs in worship, that means we'll soon have no choir and only a rock band. Therefore, we should never do a modern song in worship. It happens a lot, too. We think if we allow one thing to happen, it means something horrible is going to happen later. We can have multiple kinds of music. We don't only have Gregorian chant. We don't only have organ. We don't only have piano. We don't only have hymns written in the 60s or the 1800s. So the slippery slope is used all the time to say, hey, if we go down this path, obviously this horrible thing is going to happen later. And sometimes it may be the case, but often it is not, because people know how to stop before going all the way down the slope. Everything leads to something. Next up is another common fallacy, the hasty generalization. The hasty generalization fallacy is when we base a conclusion based on insufficient or biased evidence. We rush to a conclusion before we have all the relevant information, and it's often the outcome or conclusion we kind of desire. For example, the youth sang a contemporary worship song today at church, and I can tell you all contemporary worship is bad and we shouldn't do it ever again. That's a hasty generalization. The reality is, there are a lot of really, really, really bad hymns. The good thing is, we've had hundreds of years to kind of boil down what are the good hymns and what are the bad hymns. And there's still some hymns that people don't like to sing. You know, for instance, like In the Garden. That's either people's favorite hymn, they love it, or they hate it. There's no halfway with that song. There's some other hymns in the hymnal that uh, we've talked about on staff that, you know, one person hates and another person loves. But there are a lot of hymns that aren't in hymnals anymore that pretty much most people think are bad. They've had time to distill it. There are some contemporary worship songs that are really, really bad. There are also some really good ones. So because you hear one you don't like doesn't mean all contemporary worship is bad. Or if someone hears one traditional anthem and they don't like to say, I can never go to a church that has traditional anthems because they all must be horrible. Another example. My church just hired a new pastor, and after one Sunday, I can tell church is going to be boring and uninspiring from now on. So, you know, in the first example, the author is basing her evaluation of all contemporary music on one song the youth chose. Just like their favorite hymns and disliked hymns, there will be contemporary songs that are liked and not. We haven't had time to always go through all the best and worst contemporary songs yet. To make a fair and reasonable evaluation, the author must... Uh, Listen to several styles and examples of contemporary worship music to have sufficient evidence to base a conclusion that all is bad. In the second example, the person is making a conclusion based on one Sunday of a new pastor. The new pastor was probably nervous, trying to understand and get a feel for the church and worship, and was probably overwhelmed with moving and transitions. The person doesn't have enough information to make such a generalized and absolute claim. Other examples, I used a bathroom in France once and it was gross. All bathrooms in France are gross. You went to one. Or I met a rude French person. All French people are rude. Or on the flip side, I met a nice whatever kind of person. All these kind of people are nice. We make hasty generalizations all the time about different kinds of people, about People make assumptions and generalizations about Christians, about non-Christians, about Democrats, about Republicans, about people living on this side of the shore or that side of the shore. Without sufficient evidence, we make these generalizations, and that is a logical fallacy. Next up is another fun Latin-named fallacy, post hoc ergo propter hoc. So it's Latin for after this, therefore, because of this. It's also the title of a great West Wing episode. The logical fallacy is when someone makes an assumption that if A occurred after B, then B must have caused A. For example, the church recently purchased a new organ. The organist was diagnosed with a terminal illness two months later. 
the new organ must have caused the illness. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. But in this example, it is assumed that if one event chronologically follows another, the first event must have caused the second. But the illness may just have been undiagnosed for months. It might have been genetic. It could just be pure bad luck. There is no reason without more evidence to assume the organ caused the organness to get sick. But that is a true one I have heard from a church in the past. What we do see a lot among Christians is assuming because something bad happens, God must have done it out of displeasure. A startling number of American Christians believe the coronavirus is a judgment from God. That's a whole other thing right there. But I've seen Christians say hurricanes and other natural disasters are caused by an action a a state, a country, a, a town took. A couple years ago, a certain pastor claimed that flooding in Houston was caused by decisions and actions the city had taken. A year later, this particular pastor's house was destroyed by a flood. He was very silent on the reason why. So here's another example of the logical fallacy at work. The church recently voted against approving a new mission project. A fire destroyed the sanctuary a month later. God must have sent the fire because God was angry. There's a lot wrong with that example, but the logical fallacy is thinking because the fire came after the vote, the vote must have caused the fire. It might have been faulty electrics, or a worship pastor got a little too ambitious during a Taze service with candles. Either way, it is dangerous to assume God was angry at a particular vote. Even if you think God would do that, I don't think God would. I mean, it happened two months later. What other things could God have been angry about at these past two months? When people say something like this, they're always trying to put God on their side against something they disagree with and use tragedy to advance their agenda. And both liberals and conservatives have been guilty of this in the past. So post hoc air propter hoc fallacy is something happened, something else happened, that something else was caused by the first. Sometimes that can be a case. There often is a chain of events consequences, but you have to actually have evidence of that, not just say, well, this happened because that happened. You have to have other reasons than that. We'll do one more fallacy today and then some more next week. So our last logical fallacy we'll talk about today is the genetic fallacy. This is when we come to... Uh, We assume a conclusion based on the origins of a person, idea, plan, etc. I think we see this a lot in politics right now. We often dismiss any plan or idea from the party we do not align ourselves with and assume it must be horrible. If we do not like a particular politician, we falsely assume they couldn't possibly have any good ideas at all. Example. It's a true one, I heard. Not at this church, another church. Red is a horrible choice for the new carpet in the sanctuary because Mrs. Miller chose it and she is the most disagreeable lady in the church. I used a false name. There was no real Mrs. Miller, but I've actually heard that before. In this example, the author is equating the quality of a carpet color choice with the character of the person who suggested it. However, the two are not inherently related. You might choose to say, hey, we don't want to choose Mrs. Miller's color because we just don't like her. We don't want to make her happy. I mean, you can make that argument. Not really nice. But the quality of the choice shouldn't be tied to the person who made it. This is the problem we have a lot of times. We assume the people we don't like can't have any good ideas, so we automatically shut these things down which shouldn't be the case. We can't just say, this is not a good choice and idea because this person happened to say it. That is a fallacy because the two are not inherently related. All right, so that was a list of logical fallacies for this week. We'll do some more next week, including begging the question and ad hominem attack and a bunch of other fun ones like the red herring fallacy. So join us next week to learn more about logical fallacies.